Hello and welcome to The Postcard Professor, where we take complex ideas and explain them in the space of a postcard. In this video, we're going to be working through an example using the 2D frame element. As always, let's start out by drawing the example problem. We're going to be looking at a frame with two elements and three nodes. And we will have a force on this third node off to the right. Just so that we can end up with some numbers at the end, let's go ahead and provide some values for E, I, A, and L for these elements. And we'll just assume that all of the elements are exactly the same. Now we have two elements, so let's look at each of those individually and just label all of our forces and moments. In both cases, we're gonna have forces in the X and Y on each of our nodes. And we label these so that the subscript refers to the node and the superscript refers to the element. Now for each node, there are two forces and a moment. Uh, those three items refer to the three degrees of freedom that we have on each node. So for each of these elements, we expect to have a six by six matrix. So we will refer back to the theory section uh, so that we can write that first elemental stiffness matrix. If you recall, we have in a frame uh, the values for both a beam and a truss. We need to incorporate both of these into both of our elements. Let's go ahead and start writing the stiffness matrix for element one. Now, out in front, the easiest way to do this is to pull out an E over L cubed, and then we're going to have to distribute this I, and then we'll have to do something a little bit weird for the truss element just to make everything line up. Now, looking at this element, we are perfectly horizontal, which means that theta is equal to zero degrees. What that means for us is cosine theta, or C, is equal to one, and sine theta, or S is gonna be equal to zero. So everywhere on our base matrix that we see an S, we can just set the entire thing equal to zero, and then Cs will just be equal to one. So from the beam section, we're going to have 12 in the middle, and we need to multiply by this I, and so we get 12I in the two two spot. Then we'll end up with six IL in this location, and 6IL in the 3, 2 spot, and then 4IL squared in the 3, 3 spot. Now, all of these are going to be zero, but we're going to wait until we have both pieces in before we go ahead and write all our zeros out. So we can go ahead and do that for the other three sub-matrices, and we'll end up with the beam part in this element. So with the beam taken care of, we can move on to the truss. Now, we took out an EL cubed here, and so whatever we end up left over with is going to have to be multiplied by AL squared in order to make things match up. The truss is actually pretty easy here because we have a lot of zeros already, and then the sine thetas are all going to be equal to zero, so we only actually end up with one component in each of the submatrices. And so the end result here is going to be AL squared in the one one spot. And then down here in the four one spot, we'll have a negative AL squared. One four will be the same. And then the four four spot will have AL squared again. And finally, we can close this out with our zeros. And that will be the stiffness matrix for element one. Now let's move these over and we'll do the same for element two. So this is going to be the stiffness matrix for element two, and that's going to have the E over L cubed out front again. And this time we're going to have C is equal to zero and S is equal to negative one. So in this case for our beam, we're going to end up with a 12 I in the one one spot. And then the cosines happen in a bit of a cross pattern, and so we can ignore all those. And so just the corners are gonna have 
um, values. So this will be negative 6IL in the 1, 3 spots, negative 6IL in the 3, 1 spots, and then 4IL squared in the 3, 3 spot. And we can continue that pattern throughout the rest of the submatrices. And I made a mistake here. These are positive because our sign is negative 1. So these values here will both be positive. Likewise, this is positive, and this point here is negative. For our truss stiffness matrix, this time the only location that survives is the S squared location. And so we're going to end up with AL squared in the center of each of these submatrices. And then once we have all of that in, we can put zeros everywhere else. Now in the situation where we have sine and cosine that are not a nice easy zero and one, of course, um, there's going to be a lot more uh, of a split, right? We'll have the full three by three of each submatrix populated, and then the full two by two here populated. So things get a little messy in that situation. But hopefully, if you're doing any of those, you'll be using a computer rather than trying to do it by hand. All right, in order to assemble, it's helpful to remind ourselves what these matrices are actually linking to. And so the first column here is referring to U1 the second to V1, and the third to V1, our rotation. And then the next three columns here are U2, V2, and V2. And then for this other one, of course, the first set of three is for node two, and the last set of three is for node three. We can likewise separate out our rows. So the first row is gonna be referring to the force in the X on node one, the second force in the Y on node one, and the third, the moment on node one, and then the same for node two in the bottom three. And then we're looking at nodes two and three for elements two. So with all of the defined, we can go ahead and build out our nine by nine matrix. For sanity's sake and just for space, I'm not going to write all that out with each individual piece in play. Instead, I'm going to do some shorthands and say that this first three, so fx1, fy1, and m1, we're going to write just as a little sub vector of forces. We're going to do the same for node two and node three. And that's going to be equal to this e over l cubed that we have. And we're going to have that nine by nine matrix. But again, instead of writing out each of those values, we're going to write this as submatrices. And so this will be our KG11 from element one. That refers to the effect of the forces of node one on the displacements of node one. And then we'll have KG21 for element one, which is the effect of the forces on node two on the displacements of node one. And then we'll also have our KG21 from element one. And then finally, for this 2 2 spot, we're actually going to have two submatrices, right? We'll have this piece and this piece, which will be added together. So that will be KG22 from element one plus KG22 from element two. And then we have the 2-2 two, two spot taken care of, and so now we just need to write the 2-3, two, 3-2, three, three, two, and 3-3 three, three spots. We have no direct effect of the forces on node 3 from the displacements on node 1, or vice versa. So these are both 0. For our displacements, again, we're just going to have three subvectors referring to the displacements on node 1, node 2, and node 3. All right, applying our boundary conditions. We know that node one here is clamped to the wall, and so it's not gonna have displacements in X, Y, or in our rotation. And so we can just set this to a zero vector. U2 and U3 need to be left alone because those can move in all three ways. 
Now, the force that we have on node one is gonna be composed of the three reaction forces of the wall. So I'm gonna call this Fx1, Fy1, and M1, but I'm referring to those reaction forces, which are unknowns at this point. The forces on node two, well, we have no external forces on node two, so this is just a vector of zeros. And then for node three, we have a force P in the X direction. So our X component here is gonna be P and the other two are gonna be zeros. Ignoring our top row and setting the contribution of this part to zero, since all the displacements are zero there, we can create a system of equations based off of this six by six matrix. And this system of equations is solvable just by inverting this matrix and multiplying by this vector of forces. And so what we end up with here is a vector of displacements U2, which of course is equal to our X displacement for node two, the Y displacement, and then the rotational displacement. And those values are half a millimeter, 25 millimeters, and 0 0.05 radians. And we can also find U3, which is just our three displacements for node three. And those are equal to 67 millimeters, 25 millimeters again, and 0 0.075 radians. With these in hand, we can go back and calculate the reaction forces by multiplying this nine by one vector by the top three rows here. But we'll leave that for another time. And just looking at these results, making sure that they make sense, the movement of node two is significantly more upward than it is outward. So this movement in the X direction is because of the extension of the rod, whereas the movement upward is because we're applying a moment with this force P. And so we're bending this rod upward. And so we see that that bending is actually significantly more important than the extension. And we see just a little bit of rotation at that node two location. For node three, again, we see that exact same V3. And that's just because we don't have any extensive forces on this element. And so that's force outward doesn't change the vertical displacement between the two nodes. However, we see a large displacement in U3 compared to U2. And that's because this beam is able to bend on top of the rotational displacement that already exists at node two. And so we see that rotational displacement increases, this is bending more, and then it's also moving significantly outward. So that concludes our little example. I hope that this was helpful and we will see you next time.